Well, good morning. Uh, subcommittee will come to order, and uh, it's uh, want to welcome to uh, the second hearing of the Ag Appropriations uh, Subcommittee. And uh, we're off to a quick and good start this year, and it's uh, good to uh, welcome uh, our uh, the Office of the Inspector General uh, to the hearing this morning. Um, on Wednesday, I shared some uh, details uh, at our first hearing uh, about the themes that we have set to guide the subcommittee's work for FY16. And just to briefly uh, mention those, number one, improving the management of our agencies and programs. Number two, targeting funds to the most important programs and functions. And number three, the promoting U.S. agriculture, free and fair markets, and safe uh, food and medicines. So summary, management, targeting, and promotion. Uh, today we'll focus on theme number one, improving the management of our agencies and programs. This builds off our oversight activities over the past several years, and it corresponds with the Inspector General's office on these efforts as well. Uh, we uh, want to uh, welcome you, Ms. Fong, and also uh, Ms. Coffey, uh, Ms. Tarden, uh, to uh, our subcommittee today. We look forward to learning more about your work to encourage USDA to improve its governance processes and internal controls and be more disciplined and transparent in its decision making. This subcommittee respects your work that you do. Uh, and we appreciate your recommendations on the ways that you uh, continually try to improve uh, and to manage of a large, very complex, and important part of the federal government. In closing, I do want to thank you for agreeing to review the New York Times allegation about the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center in Clay Center, Nebraska. The article described research and attitudes that seem to be pretty much in, pretty inconsistent with the uh, conscientious, the hardworking scientists and the staff that uh, work there and uh, that we have at the Agricultural Research Service. Your assistance in auditing the claims uh, included in the article and reviewing the current conditions, practices and policies would be very helpful to us. Uh, before um, I uh, recognize our ranking member, the uh, Honorable Sam Farr, for his opening statement, I'd like to thank him for his cooperation and I want to thank him for his working relationship we have on this uh, sub subcommittee. Sometimes we have different uh, priorities, uh, but uh, I think we both want USDA to be effective and efficient in implementing the laws and programs that uh, Congress gives it to benefit the American people. So uh, I do want to point out, um, Mr. Farr, for your uh, cooperation with the subcommittee and for your, your work. So at this time, let me turn it, the mic over to you and let for any opening comments that you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think the only differences we have is accent. <laughs> you all have to come back now. Um, but uh, thank you very much. No, I don't have any opening statement. I'm always uh, uh, interested in, in the IG, and and I sort of, I don't know why, I always thought that every agency had an IG, but I, I'm now on the Ledge Branch uh, Subcommittee on Appropriations, and we don't have any IG that I know of, or maybe we have sort of read I'd be appreciated in sort of sidebar comments about how many agencies don't have uh, IG review maybe Congress ought to have it anyway uh, I, I look forward and do and I want to echo what the chairman said uh, on the animal uh, treatment center and I'm sure it's going to open up a lot of issues with a lot of university research areas but it's it's worth looking into I know California has um, Required all the research institutions at the in the state universities to change all their caging and animal husbandry practices to bring in humane practices, state of the art humane practice. Very expensive to bring it all up, but they did it, and I think that's probably something that we in Congress ought to look at. So thank you for coming today, and look forward to your comments. Okay, Ms. Fong, thank thank you. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Farr, and members of the subcommittee. We appreciate the opportunity to appear today to talk about our oversight of USD activities and our FY 2016 budget request. Um, as you know, our office provides audit and investigative services to help the department deliver its programs effectively and with integrity. Effective management of USDA programs continues to be a challenge for all of us. In an era of limited resources, it is critical that benefits be delivered effectively to the right recipients in the right amounts using the right procedures. 
while we are seeing progress at USDA, a sustained focus on excellent management is key, and we appreciate this subcommittee's keen interest in these issues. Since you have my full written statement for the record, let me just highlight some of our recent accomplishments as well as some of the work that we have in progress. Um, in the area of food safety, as you know, we completed an investigation of a California meat processing plant that was processing diseased cattle for human consumption and avoiding FSIS inspection. Um, the owner and two of the employees have pled guilty to violating the law, and FSIS suspended operations at that plant, which was eventually sold to a new owner. We currently have significant audits ongoing on FSIS's sampling and testing of ground turkey and the new information system that FSIS is developing for its inspection data. We also focus a lot of our effort helping USDA strengthen the delivery of its benefit programs. As you all know, the SNAP program alone um, is the largest part of USDA's portfolio with $84 billion last year. And so we have devoted over half of our investigative resources to cases involving SNAP trafficking. They, we've gotten tremendous results out of that, over 484 convictions and $77 million in dollar results. We currently have an audit going on on the accuracy of SNAP error rates, which we will be happy to talk about in more detail. In the area of farm and conservation programs, which totaled about $23 billion last year in, in USDA's portfolio, we reviewed RMA's crop insurance plan for pasture, rangeland, and forage. We found that there were some um, challenges to how insurance rates are set for various producers there, and we made some initial recommendations to the department. We are working to more fully evaluate that program and we will expect to have an audit on that coming out this year. We're also looking at NRCS's controls over land valuations for conservation easements. And finally, as you know, we focus quite a bit of our attention on the department's management systems. We have issued numerous reports this year on the financial statements, IT systems, improper payments, the civil rights programs, and financial management at the department. While we have seen progress in several areas, we believe that concerted attention needs to be paid to all of these issues. We have a number of upcoming audits coming out on the use of purchase cards, the claims resolution process for black, Hispanic, and women farmers, and FSA's initiative to modernize its IT systems. Um, in conclusion, let me briefly address our budget request for FY16. I want to thank the chairman and this subcommittee for your ongoing support of our work. We truly appreciate the resources that you have made available to us. In our 16 request, we are asking for two initiatives, funds for two new initiatives, to help us address some of the most critical management challenges facing USDA, namely improper payments and IT security. Uh, with the increase in funds, we will be able to uh, do additional data analytics work and review all of the department's agencies with respect to IT controls. Um, so with that, I would like to conclude my statement and, and just thank you again for inviting us, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your uh, testimony, and again, we, as I mentioned earlier, we do respect your work, uh, all of that all of you do uh, at the uh, uh, Office of Inspector General, and uh, so we uh, look forward to uh, having some uh, um, Q&A and just have a chance to, to ta ask about a few areas in particular. Uh, in prior years, we've discussed that the uh, Office of the Inspector General has a unique position uh, within the U.S. Department of Agriculture and is able to see its challenges and its successes. Um, Secretary Vilsack uh, will be before this uh, subcommittee in a couple of weeks. And uh, we uh, just let me throw out just challenges that uh, we should ask him about that uh, you may want that do you think might be important for us to, to note. And um, just so let me just open the floor in general. And there's anything that you can think of that, uh, you know, are challenges for the department that, you know, w would be a good uh, topic of conversation during his time here. Okay. Um, that's a terrific question. And in thinking, uh, in preparation for this hearing, I would like to offer three thoughts. Um, overall, I think the department 
has stated that management is one of its top priorities. What we are seeing is that every agency has challenges in making sure that as it delivers its programs, it remembers that it's important to deliver those programs according to good and fair and transparent procedures and to make sure that the right people are getting the right funds. And we have seen um, challenges in internal controls, as you mentioned in your open opening statement, that just needs a lot of attention at the agency level, each agency. The second thought I would offer is that improper payments needs to be a continued focus for the department. Um, the rate of improper payments, as reported by the department, is not declining, especially in the high-risk programs. And the methodology for identifying those payments and, and reducing them is something that requires a lot of focus and attention. And the third thought that I would offer is that we are doing a lot of work on IT systems, both um, in terms of IT security across the department, as well as in the ramping up of new IT systems to manage program activities. And as you know, um, with the increased automation of, of all of the federal government's activities, it's imperative that we have systems that are effective, that are not susceptible to um, control issues, and that actually help farmers and recipients and, and clients of the department. So those are three themes that I would emphasize. <coughs> um, you mentioned in, in your answer there, you talked about uh, uh, the improper payments, and that's an area that um, I think you're saying that the department could do a better job um, in. Um, what, uh, any other areas, um, and of course IT you mentioned, uh, the, the three things that you mentioned, would that be the areas that you think the department could do a better job in? Is there and anything else you want to, you would like to add to that, or is that pretty much sums it up pretty well? Well, I, I think those are, are three very good challenges and, yeah. and overall management controls. Um, as you know, we also do a report every year that lays out our top ten management challenges for the department. And, uh, you know, we, we go through those issues. I think those are all good issues as well for the, for the department to focus on. Um, and, you know, we, t we talk about coordination with other agencies, for example, in food safety, the need to to have open dialogue with FDA. Um, <laughs> yeah, other, you area, other areas that, that we cover in the Management Challenges Report deal with the outreach, which gets into the civil rights arena and, and how we're getting the de delivery to the, to the intended recipients. Um, trade is an issue, and making sure you have you know, good performance measures and, and knowing where you're going there and working transparently. Uh, we also talk in terms of you know, thinking of uh, secession planning type things, the human resource element and having people in place to know how to deliver the programs in the right way so, so that you're delivering them as, in, as intended. And, and food safety is also an, another area that, we, that we've hit on and, and also GAO hits on in, in terms of it being a very critical weakness okay. as well. Um, my time is running short. Let me just, uh, I tell you what, let me, I'll just come back, so let me go on to uh, Mr. Farr. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I, um, I'm always curious in your recommendations because I, I, I'm, what I'm curious about is how many of those recommendations that you make can be um, fixed administratively just by uh, administrative rulemaking or uh, management uh, changes and when it becomes necessary to recommend statutory changes how do they get to us i mean i i my first job when i got in government i after getting out of the peace corps was working for the legislative analyst office in in california and that and our job was not only to analyze the impact of all proposed legislation and to analyze the, the governor's budget but it was also to add sort of value added of what do you think government ought to be doing to, to do it better? And it, we could actually make recommendations uh, as to changes that ought to be made. And it seems to me that's wonder the wonderful role that you have is you, not only to inspect and, and see whether the uh, agencies are following the law, but sometimes w we've created over years, and you've obviously created a lot of dumb law. I mean, we just, we know, we don't eliminate ba ba uh, old law. We just pile new law on top of it. And there's some, a lot of confusion. And when you see sort of what I call dumb-dumb, because I'm always asking federal employees 
tell me dumb dumb things because we like to fix those. Uh, do we? Is there a process in in, in the I, in IG's uh, uh, role to to get that brought to the whatever attention, le the con congressional attention, uh, the proper committees, or to the secretaries who can administratively change it? Do you have some ability to be creative? I mean, you talked about the rural housing service here, uh, how the, the, the RHS could improve how it services, how it could service its accounts. You also worked with the, to ensure that USDA funds are being properly uh, used to spur rural development. I, I find our, one of our problems is that we, we, we think of rural development in silos. We don't think of it a really economic development in a, in a whole community sense. And you did in the Colorado and New Mexico on your hay producers between the non-irrigated and the irrigated come up that there's there's insurance that you had one size fitting all which they aren't the same size they aren't the same thing. So how do those how do those recommendations get into being uh, effectively uh, implemented or change? Are we how do we implement change? Well, I think that's a very good question, and we we should discuss how our recommendations are handled. Um, as, as you know, we issue hundreds of recommendations a year. Many of them are focused on administrative action because it, many changes don't require the level of um, involvement to have a congressional or legislative solution. And to the extent that we can get agency agreement on that in terms of collecting money or changing a procedure or tra doing better training um, or doing a better implementation of its IT system, that's, that's the kind of recommenda that recommendation that should be made. There are other situations, as you point out, where really the issues become a little more policy-oriented or may require a closer look at the current statute. And we have, over the years, noticed a number of those situations. What we tend to do is to talk to the agency, because the agency generally has some thoughts about it as well, um, s many of these issues are complex. The bottom line is that we do make recommendations that might require or that we that will call for legislative change. Um, we have on occasion surfaced then, those. Excuse me, but then that would have to go through the secretary, for example, to get to us, or would that something that we would know of? Where you recommended yeah, legislative change? Yeah, we 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 surface them in our audits as audit recommendations. Traditionally, what we have done is recommended to the agency and to the secretary that they pursue legislative change to a statute. Um, we don't always get agreement on that, but those recommendations are in our audit reports, and we um, make those reports available to all of you. Gil, did you want to uh, add some comments? And you also that? have sort of a de minimis rule. I mean, that, this, that there may be some... Um, money that was misused or but it's um i think in this food stamps you pointed out i mean it was interesting that the i thought it was kind of a de minimis amount of twelve hundred dollars but then you pointed out that it was linked to a drug cartel and that was that way you, <coughs> you were able to uh s see how the food stamps were being distributed i mean obviously that was a good deal to go after the drug cartel i'm not sure <coughs> how much you know just when, when you have de minimis, sort of whatever that de minimis is, is there, is there that gone into consideration? Um, I think we're talking about an investigation matter. And what frequently happens is that we work many investigations matters jointly with other law enforcement entities. Frequently, if, if an entity, another agency, law enforcement agency, has a case going on, and they note that in the full in the list of violations, potential violations, there may be a food stamp connection. They will reach out to us to um, ask us to help them prosecute that, and that will I see. enable a, a a joint effort. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Roney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> I want to talk about the uh, APHIS plant protection and quarantine preclearance report. Uh, in reviewing your report from last year, I was surprised to discover all the shortcomings uh, uncovered by the IG. Invasive species are a significant problem, as you know, in my state of Florida. And I'm happy that the recommendation presented as a result of your audit has mostly been accepted by APHIS. 
I do remain concerned about the effectiveness of this program as a means to prevent future invasives from entering our country. So my question is, in light of the whole greening phenomenon that we have in the state of Florida with our, our citrus industry, which I represent a large portion of in the center of the state, what are the follow-up procedures uh, your organization will conduct in this, on this audit? What is the timeline, if any? And if, an, if the agency is delinquent in implementing your recommendations, what recourse is there, if any? Thank you. You want to yeah, I will I'll take that. Um, in terms of the recommendations that we made, just to, to some follow up, we have reached agreement with the agency, so all the recommendations are agreed to, and so they are in the process of implementing them now. Uh, what our normal course with this, as well as other audit related matters, would be in the future is we would monitor to see are they meeting you know, what they are saying they are going to do in terms of implementing it, and then possibly going back in and following up on the recommendations in the future uh, to see that the, the actions were taken. What, is, is, there, is there a punishment if they, if, if they don't complete it in the way that you, know, you are recommending, or how, what is their incentive to do what should be done? I, I guess the way that I would answer that, I, I don't have a, a, a hammer that I can go in and hit them with, if that is if that's kind of the question. Uh, but <laughs> I don't have that. You know, but it would be following up you know, and, and raising it to the attention of, of management officials above them if it still hasn't been met. You know, one of the things about the Secretary and this administration is they have been very open to what we have been saying. So, you know, I'm, you know, so as we surface things and keep raising them, they, they make sure they are paying attention to them. Um, I would also note that under the law, uh, agencies have a certain amount of time in which to uh, resolve recommendations and to implement. And if, if these things don't happen in the, at the appropriate time, we do, we are required as an IG office to report those. And so we can make sure that, you know, we, we have you on our distribution list for our semi-annual reports, which will track all of these recommendations. Well, I, uh, again, I don't mean to state the obvious because you all know this, but uh, we, we were very successful on this committee in appropriating funds to try to combat the things that we're talking about here. But it would be much more preferable. I mean, and that's a great victory. But if, if we could just not have these things, you know, reach our, our plants to begin with, obviously we all know that that's, that's the most preferable. So this, this is as important, in my opinion, a, as that funding. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much for being here today, and thank you for your work. I want to just add my voice to the choruses of concern around the very troubling New York Times story that was mentioned about animal research. Um, so I'm hopeful that we are going to do some more investigating into that, and obviously many of the concerns that were raised in that story um, about how the spending of taxpayer dollars in humane treatment, um, basically. Uh, bordering on the bazaar, in fact, and some of the things that were being researched, in my opinion, and even more importantly, completely counter to what the consumer is looking for today. I mean, the market is growing in humanely raised and, you know, different levels of treatment for animals. So why this taxpayer dollars is being spent in something that's clearly inappropriate practice, I think, raises a lot of questions. So, just want to add my concerns uh, along with the chair and the ranking member. But uh, one other thing I want to just bring up is also something that I read in the newspaper. Uh, at least I didn't find it on the Internet. Um, but there was another New York Times opinion piece about some of the issues around the pilot, U.S. state pilot pr um, plants um, in the pork processing. So I know there are some uh, Hormel plants that are um, you, under a pilot program, and there has been an OIG report which was entitled Food Safety in the Inspection Service, Inspection and Enforcement Activities at Swine Slaughter Processing Plants. But it appears um, that there are some real concerns being raised um, with the speed, with the quality of meat, with uh, 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 questionable meat being put on the market. And um, I'd just like to hear you talk a little bit more about that. I mean, obviously, we do pilot projects because we want to test and see if a method is going to work. Um, but, you know, what would you say today to somebody who wants to know if it's safe to feed their kids pork that has come out of those Hormel experimental sites? And um, I just want to hear you talk about the report a little bit. Okay. 
Uh, well, thank you. We, we also are aware of some of the news reports on that situation. And as you mentioned, we did, we did issue an audit report about a year or so ago on pork processing plants. My recollection um, of our basic findings there was, as you point out, it, it, was, it is a pilot program, the <coughs> program. And one of our main findings was, was, was that <laughs> USDA needs to take a better look at that pilot program to see if it's actually working, if, it ha if it's getting the results that they had anticipated and expected. And if it is, terrific. If not, then they need to address that. I think those are some of the main themes coming out of those inspectors' um, concerns. Some of the other concerns that were articulated were not part of our review, so we don't really have anything to, to comment on in that sense. But, but the basic point, I think, is good, that it's time to assess that, that HIMP project to see whether or not it needs to continue. Great. And, and I'll add to it that um, in response to our recommendation about, about doing an evaluation, food safety did do an evaluation. I cannot I haven't looked at the results of that yet, but the whole hemp pilot project is also coming up in other lines of food safety work that we're doing. Um, the ground turkey uh, inspection mm -hmm. that, um, that Phyllis referred to in the opening statement has a hemp angle to it. We also have on our plan to look at uh, hemp with the new chicken processing um, standards that are going in place as well. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just follow up a little bit about the improper payments, uh, which I think you've mentioned. Uh, the USDA, I guess, is still not in compliance with uh, implementing the Improper Payments Information Act. Do you have any idea in, in uh, you know, when you think they'll be in compliance or how the USDA compares to other departments in terms of their ability to, to handle the improper payments? The department is very much aware of what it needs to do to come into compliance because we, um, we're engaged in constant discussions with, with the CFO's office. They have, I think, made some progress over the years in terms of meeting those seven required steps to, uh, to identify and, and set reduction targets. They are still um, behind on three of those steps. Some of the difficulties, I think, lie in and how you set those targets and how you um, assess the level of improper payments. And some of the agencies are facing challenges in that regard. RMA in particular is, is facing those challenges, which is going to be a longer term process for them. The school lunch program, which is another one of the high risk programs, also faces challenges in setting their improper payment targets. And we have some audit work coming out on that later this year. In terms of where USDA fits in the panoply of, of federal government agencies with high-risk programs, I would say we're probably in the middle. I don't think we're the best by any means, but I don't believe we are the worst either. Okay. Let me just follow up with some of the, uh, uh, you know, some of the management challenges you, you talk about, but uh, particularly with the Food and Nutrition Service, I'm just going to ask, you know, that's one of the areas where, you know, your, your testimony says, you know, the agency generally accepted our recommendations. I mean. Does that mean they didn't accept some of them? Uh, is there some, some way that, uh, I mean, how is that communicated, what they're going to accept, what they're not going to accept, just out of curiosity? Yeah. Um, and this goes to how we, we issue our audit reports. When we issue an audit report in final, we will list each of our recommendations, and then we will summarize the agency's response to our recommendation by recommendation and our position on that. Um, in, in the best of all possible worlds, we would reach agreement or management decision with the agency at the time we issue our report, which means that if we recommend something, the agency will say, yes, we agree and we're going to take corrective action. Doesn't always happen, um, especially on recommendations that m may have a little more policy complexity to them. Sometimes the agency will say, we need to, to think about this a little bit more, or they may not um, be able to commit to specific targets for action, and that means that that recommendation will be open until they commit to a specific date for action. Okay. Now, the, the, I understand that USDA does have a reporting process that's used uh, to follow up on whether your recommendations are implemented. Uh, do you have any recommendations? I mean, um, is, is it effective? If it's not, do you have any recommendations on how to strengthen that process? I, I think the process the department has right now is working pretty well. 
I mean, we make our recommendations and going back to the, to the FNS report you, you referred to, following that report, we had follow-up conversations with the agency. We've now reached agreement on all six of the recommendations in that report. So the process then kicks over to where they report to OCFO what they've agreed to do with us, and we can follow up with OCFO you know, at different points in time to see if they've done it. If they haven't, we can go back to the agency and, and find out why. Now, it, it, just to f uh, finish up with the FNS, I mean, in your um, testimony it says, in our upcoming work, OIG will determine if SN FNS has adequate controls to ensure that SNAP error rates are accurate and if the agency is taking adequate action to reduce these rates. Uh, I, I take it SNAP is a high risk, one of these high risk. Definitely, I mean, we had a case in Baltimore, you know, $1.2 million uh, uh, fraud going on there. Um, do you, I mean, are you going to, what do you think? Do you think FNS has adequate controls right now? I mean, it, it suggests that, you know, you're going to determine if they have controls. How can you not have determined that up till now in a high risk program? It just, it's strange that it says you're going to look at this in the future. I mean, this is a huge program. Uh, with the largest, uh, fastest growing entitlement in the United States right now, uh, and you're not certain that they have adequate controls? The work we undertook was, and it's the first time we've looked at it in, in, a, in a period of time, to look at their process and how their process works. And so we're looking to see if they, they have a process where states do a certain amount of sampling and then FNS overlays some sampling on that. We're looking to see if the states are doing what they have committed to do and if FNS is following up and doing what they're supposed to do, so that which produces the, the error rate that they, they put out every year. Let me ask you a question out of curiosity. What's the state's incentive to, uh, to be frugal with the federal taxpayer dollar? I mean, this is 100 percent federal dollars. Uh, why would a state uh, not spend more time looking for fraud in an area where they actually can affect their state budget dollars rather than a pass-through dollar? I'm going to separate that out just a little bit. Okay. Right. On, on the quality control side, they are looking to see did they make the right payment in the right amount, over or under. There are incentives that, that they have that they provide to states for getting that amount right. There are also um, sanctions that they will they place on states if their error rates are, are too high, generally. On the fraud side... You can follow. I think my time is up. You might want to just follow up in writing. If you could, we're, we're, we just got noticed we're going to have votes in a few minutes, and I want to try to go ahead and get a full round, so we'll try to, I'm going to, try to stay as close on time as possible. So, Mr. Bishop. Thank you very much. Uh, I know that there are incentives, uh, just to follow up with uh, the gentleman's question, uh, as to why states would want to pay attention. Uh, Georgia has had a, a very, very uh, tarred experience with the department because of some uh, uh, inappropriate uh, payments, and it took uh, quite a quite a while to try to get that resolved. Uh, there are sanctions, and they they have a fiscal impact, which uh, certainly affects a lot of our constituents, um, both on the government side and the recipient side. Uh, let me uh, turn to uh, what your but your budget justification uh, indicated that. Uh, you continue to see individuals providing false information to obtain FSA monies uh, through several programs and that you will allocate resources as needed to investigate potential fraud in FSA programs. Um, I think it was reported that uh, some of the farm subsidy payments uh, went to 28,613 deceased farmers between 2011 and 2012 of which 1,799 were deemed improper, according to the GAO report that was issued in June of 2013. Additionally, GAO determined that about 6 percent of the total subsidy payments <coughs> should not have been sent due to clerical error or outright fraud. <coughs> Can you tell us what the current level of, of OIG resources are that are dedicated to the FSA, what's planned for 2016? Uh, if any investigations of fraud and related activity uh, have been conducted with respect to FSA programs over the past couple of years. Uh, I'm a very strong support, supporter of our uh, uh, FSA programs, as I am for SNAP and WIC, uh, but I think all of us agree that fraud should be routed out uh, no matter where it is, uh, and I believe that uh, we need to be concerned with the uh, level of attention which has been reaped on 
SNAP versus the other programs, such as uh, risk management, the conservation programs. Um, and so I, I, I'd really like uh, to, to, can you tell me what the, the fraud rate, the error rate is? Uh, I know that SNAP and WIC are, are large programs, uh, but what is the percentage error rate there um, uh, compared to the other programs? Because I, I think I was under the understanding that really that percentage of the total uh, claims was, was, was small compared to some of the other programs that don't get as much attention. Let me, let me just offer a few comments and then I'll ask Gil and, and Anne. Uh, we also share your view that we need to address fraud wherever it occurs in USDA's portfolio. And we are paying attention to allegations and issues in the farm um, programs and, and crop insurance programs, and I know we have some good examples of that. In terms of the improper payment rates, you do have, um, I think you're correct, that in terms of what the department reports as improper payment rates, uh, in, in the, um, the food stamp program, it tends to be in the 3 to 4 percent range. In some of the other programs, say the RMA and NRCS programs, the improper payment rate is much higher in the teens, maybe near 20 percent. Um, there are probably a number of reasons for that. We are paying very close attention to that. And um, let me just offer the chance to comment to Gil and Ann. The, the thing that I would add to that, too, I mean, we are mindful of it, but the FSA percentages for their, their high-risk programs for FSA are, are lower, uh, some of the lower percentages. But we do keep them on the radar screen. I'd like to just address the question you had raised about what sorts of resources we're allocating towards FSA investigative work. Um, historically, we have focused quite a bit of our resources on the SNAP program, but FSA is an area that we are definitely looking for an increase and expecting to increase our investigative work in those areas. We have had some very good cases um, within the last recent year with high dollar amounts, um, and so we do anticipate that within FY16 we will be increasing our work in thank FSA. Thank you. Let me get on to another question quickly. Uh, that, that's the 2501 program. Uh, of course, uh, uh, it's been criticized. Uh, uh, it's been, say, it's been suspected. It's been criticized for the provision of uh, assistance and support for the disadvantaged farmers. Uh, two years ago, OIG uh, released an audit uh, and recommendations uh, with regard to uh, the implementation of the 2501 technical assistance program for disadvantaged farmers. Uh, it's my understanding that those recommendations were accepted and that they have been implemented successfully. Do you comment on that, please? Uh, yes, you're right. We, uh, we have looked at that program, and the department, the secretary, um, have made they have made the changes that were necessary to address our recommendations and to get those programs back on a good footing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll see if we can leave a little bit of time for Mr. Valdeo, Mr. Young. Um, uh, I appreciate you coming to the hearing today. It's been a very fascinating discussion. I appreciate your eye towards rooting out fraud and improper payments and uh, waste, and, and that is one of our key roles here in oversight, and you're a, a key part of that. Uh, I wanted to, to continue that line of conversation and dialogue and ask you a little bit about some of the changes that occurred uh, in the passage of the uh, Farm Bill last year and the implementation of those changes and some previous GAO recommendations. Now, I noted during the Farm Bill debate there were about $23 billion in savings that were to occur. Um, uh, and I think, in particular, I want to hone in on there were $8 billion in, dollars in savings that were related to the food stamp program, which is about 80 percent of the Farm Bill. The rest of the savings were coming from uh, removing uh, direct payments to farmers and cutting farm aid. But there was a portion of that bill and some sort of uh, bipartisan agreement that was to find savings in the food stamp program, and not by cutting benefits, but by um, trying to reduce the fraud or improper payments or any abusive practices that occur. And I note that um, there was a uh, political article that said um, the single biggest savings in, the, in, in, this, in that portion of the, the uh, 8 billion comes from cracking down on what many see as an abusive scheme employed by about 16 states 
that distribute token amounts of low-income fuel assistance to households to help them gain higher benefits. And we want to make sure that people who are eligible for benefits get the benefits they receive, and we want to make sure that those aren't eligible don't receive benefits. That way we can help those who need it the most. So I would be interested to know if you believe in your review that that is being implemented uh, and will be effective or if there uh, have been uh, problems in that implementation. And then I also know there was a GAO report in 2013 uh, that we've discussed in this committee report before that was entitled Improved Oversight of Income Eligibility Determination Needed in the uh, WIC program. And in particular, it highlighted inconsistent criteria, lack of income data, uh, inability from some states to define annual income, family or household, most recent income in a consistent way uh, that has led to that report saying uh, improved oversight of income eligibility is needed. So I guess could you comment on where the Department of Agriculture is on responding to those savings that are needed in each program in order to make sure that they get the payments that are needed to the people who deserve them? Let me start out, and then, Gil, you can jump in. Uh, those, obviously, are very sensitive and current issues. Um, with respect to the LIHEAP um, issue, we are currently doing an audit on, as, as Gil has discussed, on eligibility determinations for SNAP. I believe that that is one of the issues that we are evaluating in that audit. So right now, we, we are not able to really talk about it but we expect that report to come out in the next several months. I mean, it's, it's very close. So we will certainly um, be happy to brief you on it at the time that it comes out and talk with, talk with you about th those issues. With respect to the WIC um, eligibility issue for recipients, I don't believe our currently issued audit on WIC got to that issue. We were looking more at um, controls over state food costs at the state level and the vendor level. So we did not specifically address that issue. And because GAO did such a, a good job of it, that's not unusual. We try not to overlap our, our work. Um, Gil? Yeah, I would just add generally from the, the eligibility standpoint, that is, that is a theme or that type of theme that you mentioned from GAO comes up as we look at the other programs too. Um, that you know, They need to more closely look at you know, making sure everybody's eligible, they meet the requirements, those type of things. I would just encourage you in your efforts to really investigate uh, whether the Department of Agriculture is carrying out the um, Farm Bill in a way that's consistent with the savings that were expected by Congress. Uh, and that's going to be somewhat uh, subjective to whether they are actually carrying it out and enforcing it or whether states, these 16 states and others, continue to game the system and uh, uh, utilize this program in, in what Congress has determined is an improper way. And then these GAO reports are only good if they're followed through on. And so we really need to make sure that the Department of Ag is following through on these recommendations about income oversight to uh, really root out the improper payments or fraud or waste that are occurring. Thank you for your testimony. I have a lot of questions here, but for the sake of my friend, Mr. Valadeo, I'm going to just cut it down to one. Uh, thank you for coming today. You know, I was at the Beef Expo in Iowa over the weekend, and we eat a lot of pork and produce a lot of pork as well in Iowa, as you know. And I understand in your budget you've asked for $57 million for an uh, antibiotic resistance study on livestock. And it's a new USDA initiative. Some Maybe you've studied it a little bit in the past, but you're going to go forward, I think, and do something broader. And this causes farmers and ranchers uh, in my state and other states probably some uncertainty and some cause for, for pause right there. And just want to make sure that the, co the concerns are that sometimes this is viewed by ranchers and, and producers in a, a political science context and not sound science. And there may, there may be outside pressures. Uh, I reflect back to the GA GMO debate. Just want to know, can you provide an overview of your work so far on any of this and where you want to go on this? And also, how do you involve the agricultural community, uh, from the producers, the farmers, to veterinarians, and um, w will you be keeping us up to date on this, and how will you do that? Uh, I believe we have an ongoing audit on that. We started it last summer. Um, we are probably in the middle of field work at this point, and I'm going to ask Gil to comment on specifically what our scope is on that. I, I can kind of speak to our objective and scope. We're, we're basically looking at how the department is, is going about, you know, responding to the antibiotic resistance, you know, wh how they're going about surveillance, you know, what, what they're doing to, to match it with the silent science and stuff. It's, it's that line of questioning, but we are in the middle of field work, and I'd be more than happy to, to brief you further once, once we're further along in the process. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. I yield back. 
Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Yoder and Mr. Uh, Young. <laughs> um, last night, reading through the testimony, uh, I did notice a little bit about the cloud systems that the USDA has purchased and uh, the lack of uh, good information on how they're uh, cataloged and everything. And the fact that they only really knew that, or only 17 of the 31 were actually showing up in the inventory, and some of them were actually classified under different categories. Excuse me a little bit. Since they were what what they were, but uh, what really bothered me about this is obviously it does store producer data. I mean, what is the USDA doing? I mean, what kind of oversight can we provide uh, to make sure that what they are using these cloud systems for is secure? Because producer data, I mean, obviously we all know that there are groups out there that do not like agriculture and do not like especially animal agriculture. Uh, how safe is this data from breaches like what we've seen going on in so many different industries across the U.S. right now? Well, I th that security aspect is, is something that we run into not only in the cloud computing, but we see in many of the, the audits that we do in, in the IT arena. I will say that the department has been receptive to our, our findings and our recommendations, and, are, and they are working on it. It is one of the main reasons that we want to put forth an IT initiative with our, with our budget so that we can focus more on the security because some of the fundamental controls that they need to have is knowing their inventory of hardware and software so they know what they need to monitor and what they need to look at. That's a very scary uh, situation with it. Or they're not even sure how many of these they have. It shows they've purchased 31, but they're not even sure where they are. And it's just a, a really dangerous situation for a lot of agriculture, a lot of farmers around the U.S. So I appreciate that, and I yield back. As I mentioned, we have votes on the floor. Let me just yield to Mr. Farr and see if he has anything uh, that you wanted to uh, before I'm we. Sorry, I just appreciate the leadership you bring to this. As we prepare for our hearings, this is a, um, your report was very informative. Thank you. And uh, one thing that I do, and I'll, and I'll do it more for the record, and since we're limited here on time, but uh, I did want to uh, mention the uh, Farm Service Agency's modernize, modernize and Innovate the Delivery of Agricultural Systems, MIDAS. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, Congress and the taxpayers invested more than $400 million in that information system. It was intended to improve the management and of the antiquated IT systems of our farm programs. Um, your agency and the GAO are, are still investigating what went wrong with that, um, but it appears that USDA mismanaged this project and the funding for this critical investment. So just in closing, um, when is the estimated date for uh, completing the audit, and then I may have some questions for the record as well. Uh, we are hoping to issue a report in the next several months, probably May, I believe, and we will have recommendations, I believe. Okay. And um, we just, and like I said, we'll, I will probably have some follow-up for, for the record on that, that we want to ask some more questions on that. But again, we thank you for all for being here today. Uh, we especially... Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Fong, for your leadership and uh, all your uh, uh, distinguished awards that you have uh, received uh, during your time as uh, Inspector General. But, uh, of course, your whole team is, is great. We respect all of you for the work that you do, and we uh, thank you for the work that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, with that, uh, we will uh, appreciate you being here, and uh, the uh, hearing is adjourned. Okay.